Welcome to Transforming Energy, the NREL podcast, brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We're highlighting the latest in clean energy research happening at the lab. It's Wednesday, August 23rd. I'm Taylor Mankel. And I'm Karen Jerriman. All aboard, Karen. Before this episode leaves the station, I've got some trivia for you. What was the first coast-to-coast railroad route across the United States? Mm, Okay, the first one. Mm -hmm. Let's see, there is the Polar Express, (laughs) uh, the Hogwarts Express, the little engine that could. (laughs) I I don't know. I'm kidding, of course. It was the Transcontinental Railroad, if memory serves me. That's right. Took a couple stops, but you got us there. I love the trip into multiple fictional (laughs) universes, too. Yeah, don't worry. I found my way back eventually to the real world circa 1869. The rail industry has certainly come a long way since that transportation revolution. Uh, No kidding. And in the coming years, railroads could lay the tracks for another revolution in the form of net zero emissions operations, thanks in part to a new software tool from NREL called the Advanced Locomotive Technology and Rail Infrastructure Optimization System. Okay, that's a mouthful. Let's just stick with the acronym on that one, Altrios. This software is designed to help freight rail operators transition to clean locomotive technologies in the most cost-effective ways possible. Best part? It's the world's first fully integrated open source software to combine rail and energy storage technology modeling, train dispatching and corridor simulations, and a high-level train scheduling and routing tool into a single unified model. That's incredible. So Altrios works by simulating real-world rail network operations decades into the future. This allows researchers to evaluate which clean energy technology adoption strategies can help rail operators meet decarbonization targets while keeping operational costs and schedule impacts at a minimum. The project's principal investigator was Jason Lustbader, who is a commercial vehicle electrification researcher at NREL. He shared a little more about Altrios's capabilities. Not only does it give us near-term solutions where we can slowly build in electrification, but it allows you to adjust that to the route, to the needs of the train itself. And you can scale the electrification over time, whether that's a battery electric locomotive or it's a hydrogen locomotive. You can start as the infrastructure can support it and as the locomotive technologies are available, you can move towards more electrified railroad operations. Historically, transportation is the heaviest polluting sector of the American economy. So ambitious federal clean energy goals have called for a near total decarbonization of this sector by 2050. And the continent's largest freight railroads have also committed to cutting their greenhouse gas emissions 40 percent by 2030. Altrios is already helping to guide these goals. In one application, the software is being applied to a freight decarbonization project that is developing autonomous battery electric rail cars that travel in groups but with flexible routes. The goal is to hopefully shift from trucks to rail, which can move freight as much as four times more efficiently. And it can also be applied to passenger rail transportation or potentially adjusted to consider equity and environmental justice concerns like air quality in historically disadvantaged neighborhoods near freight hubs. Taylor, the lab published a pretty interesting press release recently that points to how quickly the adoption of renewable energy technologies is expanding across the country. It's a big deal. Yeah, the release examines NREL's ongoing research into the growing number of local zoning ordinances governing renewable energy deployment in the United States. Yeah, so this research was all about setback ordinances that determine how much land is available for deployment and the amount of wind and solar resources we have to decarbonize our energy system. Zoning laws and ordinances on state and local levels are important. They determine how and where new wind and solar projects can be deployed and make sure these projects are sustainably and responsibly developed by establishing standards for noise levels, wind turbine heights, and distances for how close development can happen to property lines, structures, and roads. And they also protect natural habitats, species, and land resources, all very, very important. Mm -hmm. Past assessments have likely overestimated how much land is available to renewables while also underestimating the cost and challenges of high levels of wind and solar deployment. NREL's recent study found that the number of local wind ordinances in effect rose considerably from 286, that's 286, in the year 2018, to 1,853 in 2022, a big increase. And a companion survey found 839 utility-scale solar ordinances in effect in 2022 as well. So that's a lot of figures, but let's talk about what it means. 
According to study author Anthony Lopez, it mostly means that the renewable energy industry is maturing and that it's important we understand the impacts of renewable development on communities. It also means we can provide information that helps communities develop ordinances balancing impacts of renewable energy development with benefits of deployment. You know, Karen, the world has some pretty iconic duos. Ah, doesn't it ever. Hall and Oates, oh, yeah. Mac and Cheese, oh, yes. Han Solo and Chewbacca, Peanut Butter and Jelly, oh. Venus and Serena Williams. I'm just getting started. Well, amazing, but you forgot one. Karen and Taylor. Oh, better uh, believe uh, it. <laughs> I mean, talk about star power and all of those duos. But I think I know where you're going with this power duo thing. I think you're right. It's the unlikely power duo of water and electricity. Huh? Now, you may think that's a bad pairing, and (laughs) for the most part, it is. For day-to-day purposes, we definitely don't want folks thinking otherwise. But back in 2012, advanced computing experts at NREL made the move to use water to cool central processing units in its data center. Yeah, this is really cool. The computing industry understandably had doubts. Mm. But as the only Department of Energy lab dedicated to energy efficiency research, NREL was uniquely positioned to challenge those traditional and energy-intensive methods like air conditioning for cooling computers. The lab decided to instead try using water to transfer heat away from the data centers. And the risk paid off. NREL's water-based cooling system has won multiple awards, and the lab has saved more than $4 million in operational costs and avoided releasing 22,829 metric tons of carbon dioxide to date. Which is essentially the equivalent of us sequestering CO2 emissions from more than 25 million pounds of coal. Incredible. It's huge. Now, all this innovation of the past decade has largely happened in the Energy Systems Integration Facility on our main campus here in Colorado. Yeah, I attended a tour of that building just a few months ago. It was really cool to learn that the ESIF, as we like to call the facility, is a LEED Platinum Certified Facility. And since 2018, it's also home to a water-based cooling technology called Thermosiphon Cooling. Enrel Supercomputer, that has lived in the ESIF since 2012, produces massive amounts of heat. So the thermosiphon technique sends that hot water from the data center through a cylindrical container that is a bundle of tubes filled with refrigerant. The refrigerant then transfers heat away from the water through evaporation. There are automatic controls that vary the fan speed to control the evaporation cycle, and any waste heat is then used to heat NREL's campus. So awesome. I challenge you to think of a better example of reduce, reuse, recycle. No kidding. Yeah. NREL partnered with Johnson Controls and Sandia National Laboratories to deploy this on the roof of the ESIF. And since this form of evaporative cooling was installed, NREL has saved more than 6.5 million, million gallons of water. To help quantify that number, the amount of water the thermosiphon saved in just its first two years could have filled three Olympic-sized pools. For a different example, a typical data center needs to dedicate 70% of its energy consumption to the task of keeping it cool. And within 10 years, NREL has dropped that to 3%, not just for the data center, but the whole ESIF building. Of course, the laboratory's pursuit of energy-efficient computing is never complete. In March 2022, NREL partnered with the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis to launch its Green Computing Catalyzer to explore data center efficiency, the waste cycle of computers and materials, and how to improve and measure the energy consumption of algorithms. And of course, we can't forget the recent installation of our Kestrel supercomputer, built by Hewlett Packard Enterprises. I got a sneak peek in my tour of ESIF, actually. Same here, Karen. And I got a look at it with Secretary Granholm when she visited a couple months back. And Kestrel, named for that falcon known for its keen eyesight and intelligence, will continue to support NREL's journey to net zero lab status. Karen, before we wrap up, as the resident vegetarian, I wanted to wish you a happy National Cuban Sandwich Day. Oh, (laughs) yes. Happy National Cuban Sandwich Day to you, too, Taylor. For those of you super confused, just go back and listen to our last episode and join the celebration with me. 
Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Now that we've been doing this for a couple months, we'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you think by emailing podcast at nrel.gov or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We would love five stars if possible. And of course, don't forget to subscribe on your favorite streaming platform so you never miss an episode. We'll be back in two weeks with more news from NREL. This episode was adapted from NREL's news articles from August 2023, authored by Brooke Van Zant, Wayne Hicks, and Anna Squires. Our theme music is written and performed by Ted Vaca, and episode music by Chuck Kernick, Jim Riley, and Mark San Severino of Drift BC. This podcast is produced by NREL's communications office and recorded at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. We express our gratitude and acknowledge that the land we are on is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute peoples. We recognize and pay respect to the indigenous peoples from our past, present, and future, and are grateful to those who have and continue to be stewards of this land.